It's California Edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. We are joined by Amanda hollis Brusky. She is a professor at Pomona College. She has a book coming out. It's called Ideas with Consequences, The Federalist Society and the Conservative Counter-Revolution, focused on the Supreme Court and the courts in general. Let's talk about the Supreme Court and then go down to the lower courts. Sure. It's interesting because over the last you know, couple decades, we've had more Democratic presidents than Republican presidents in terms of coverage, and yet the Supreme Court still feels pretty conservative. Talk to us about that. Yeah, right now what I like to say is the Supreme Court is, is about ideologically polarized as it's ever been. Mm. What I mean Even by that... from the FDR era? Just about as sort of polarized as the FDR court in the Got 1930s. It. We have four justices on the court that consistently vote conservative, all Republican appointees. Right. Four justices on the court who consistently vote liberal, all Democratic appointees, and one swing justice, right. Anthony Kennedy. Who is a Republican and was considered quite a conservative in the 90s, but he... I don't know if he's become less conservative or if our views of conservatism have changed. I would say it's issue focused, right? Mm. So on many issues that matter to conservatives and libertarians, he's in their camp. Federalism, states' mm. rights, mm. limits to the federal commerce power. But on issues such as gay rights and abortion, he's certainly been a champion and has voted with the liberal bloc in those cases. And let's talk about Anthony Kennedy and his contemporaries because there are three other justices on the court that are his age yep. or around his age to Democrats, to Republicans, Antonin Scalia being a Republican, and then the Democrats would be Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Stephen Breyer. Right. And, you know, people live longer now, but, you know, at some point, you know, someone's going to resign or pass away. What does that say to you about the future of the court? Yeah, so one of the things to remember is that, you know, the Supreme Court sort of follows the election returns. And what that means is we elect a president who then has the power to appoint judges and justices that align with his or her values. Right. And recently, those judges and justices have been staying on the court for a very long right, time. Right. Between 1789 and 1970, uh, Supreme Court justice served an average of 15 years. Many served only eight, like a two-term president. Right. And now that's jumped up to over 25 years. Wow. With most justices serving into their 30s and some into right. their 40s. Right. Right. So the implications uh, for these next two election cycles right. um, are, are pretty important for the Supreme Court. Four justices, as you said, over the age of 70. Right. Two Democrats, two Republicans. So who controls the White House in 2016, 2020 right. is going to be decisive in terms of where this court goes. And what's interesting about the whole nomination question is that, as I'm sure you may remember, a couple of years ago, uh, the Democratic majority in the Senate uh, really altered the nuclear option. Uh, the filibuster so that there are no filibusters permitted for um, appellate court and district court nominees, mm -hmm. but still for Supreme Court nominees. So regardless of who's in the majority um, in the Senate, unless they hit 60, which I don't see that happening right. for either party anytime soon, those nominations can be very contentious. They are very contentious, and they've become increasingly so since the 1970s, 1980s, right. in part because the stakes are so high. Because we see these lower federal court judges and Supreme Court justices serving longer and longer, presidents know they get one crack at this. And what seems like we are facing throughout the end of this decade, and look, anything could happen in 2016, but, you know, early betting would suggest that Hillary Clinton is a front runner. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not taking a position, but right. is a front runner. And, you know, if you had to bet today, probably the next president. But you also could argue that the Republicans probably become, you know, stronger in the Congress, both Senate and House Senate being the most important. So where do we go with that? I mean, how do you look at the Supreme Court when you have divided government likely into the next decade. Yeah, I mean, the stakes are really high. Mm. I think you're going to see a lot of contentious battles mm. over lower federal court judges, over Supreme Court nominees. And because there are some issues that have come before the court in the last six or seven years mm -hmm. that have been de decided by one vote. Right, and that being five to four. Mostly Anthony Kennedy. Mostly Anthony Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And really issues that affect all Americans, campaign finance, voting rights act, gun rights. These are issues that- Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act. Right, I mean, who thought John Roberts- Challenges continue. Right, as they do. Right, challenges continue. I want to talk about one issue though, yeah. that uh, as you know, I used to be a full-time practicing lawyer. I <laughs> worked for a federal judge, so a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. So I yeah. like to follow the court. I was stunned that the court did not take the uh, marriage equality cases because there 
Is there, there's a split in the circuits, no? Not yet. Oh, I guess technically there is not a split in the circuits. Yeah. That's the issue. All circuits have upheld marriage equality, but still I would have thought they would have taken the case. And it's not unprecedented for the Supreme Court to take a case, even right. when there is agreement in the circuits. Right. Especially, this is the civil rights issue of our generation. It is. And it's highly- it's Virginia versus Loving. You like that Loving I knew that? Virginia Which is the interracial, right. There you that go. was the law that um, overturned inter bans on interracial marriage. Yeah, and so it, when we think about uh, marriage equality, and we know, uh, well, we suspect at least, that there are five votes on the Supreme Court right now to sort of articulate a broad um, Uphold. right. So you do marriage believe equality. that Anthony Kennedy is the, because he did on the DOMA case. Defense of marriage case, right. he did. And what I suspect is the Supreme Court is trying to move incrementally on this. Um, they're going to let it sort of work its right. way through the circuits. As of right now, the practical effect of them not ruling right. means all of those circuit court rulings up, uh, striking down bans on marriage equality go into effect. But what seems to me is that the reason why these circuits, even some of the most conservative circuits, are ruling in favor of marriage equality is because they look at that DOMA case and it just seems to them that you know they need to follow precedent. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, in a way, uh, isn't it kind of a fait accompli because of the Defense of Marriage Act case? Yeah, and this is where Justice Scalia's dissent in that case is pretty prophetic because he said, Tell us. now it's inevitable. The way you've articulated the rationale for this mm -hmm. ruling makes marriage equality in every state inevitable. And of course, he's he's arguing in dissent, right. but in some ways he's, he's very prophetic. But what's interesting about the Scalia um, camp is that one would, could argue that, you know, they're about states' rights. Mm -hmm. And so couldn't one say it's a conservative position to allow states to decide on marriage equality? Yeah, and, and so what many states after 2008 banned right. Um, same-sex right. marriage. And so that states' rights argument plays in his favor. Yeah, right, that but goes what both you ways. see is, right. uh, you know, you see these justices retreat from the states' rights camp when it doesn't necessarily right. align uh, with their political preferences. Let's talk about the lower courts, the sure. appellate courts. We've been discussing it as well as the district courts where mm -hmm. I clerked in, yeah. in Colorado, for mm -hmm. example. Um, give us a sense of what's happened with those courts in terms of appointees. Yeah, so like I said, you know, the Supreme Court, but also the lower federal courts follow the election return. Mm -hmm. um, so we, between uh, Nixon forward, we had you know, 28 years of Republicans right, in right. the White House and only 18 right. Democrats. So from about 1988 until 2012, the lower federal courts were leaning Republican. Right. They were mostly Republican appointees. Sure. And it's only been in the last four years that that started to tip. And now the Democrats, there's a slight um, advantage for Democrats in the lower federal courts. And that's important because remember, the Supreme Court only takes 1% of the cases that are appealed to it every year. So most of these decisions are being hashed out mm -hmm. in these lower federal courts. And these lower federal courts, these judges can serve 40 years and oh, they're serving easily. longer and longer. Right in our own backyard in the Ninth Circuit, John Clifford Wallace, he was appointed in 1970 by so President would, Nixon. Right. And he is still on the Ninth Circuit Court Not of Appeals. Not senior status, do you know? Just in the last five years, he wants, I think. But they still, but he they still hear cases. Actually, I think he had a mimeograph machine in his office when I they started. I, there's one issue that does seem to be percolating in California, and that deals with campaign finance reform. California seems to be very vocal, at least its elected officials, against Citizens United, yeah. which kind of opened the floodgates for spending, looking towards increasing disclosure yeah. in terms terms of donors to campaigns. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, disclosure is extremely important to California, given how much we, we rely on the ballot right. initiative. Right. Um, I think I was reading in 2012 alone, opponents and supporters of ballot initiatives spent somewhere around $477 million. Wow, wow. That's nearly half of what was spent across the entire country that year on ballot initiatives. Right. And the only reason we know where that money is coming from are because of these disclosure laws, laws that require individuals and businesses to disclose their financial and contributions. And one could argue in our final moments that the Supreme Court would be protective of anonymity, whereas California is trying to take the veil off of anonymity. Yeah, and what the Supreme Court has said, they've, they've upheld disclosure laws right. up to this point, but these, um, the lower federal courts, there's a group of lawyers, the same group that bought right. a Citizens United, right. who are saying this is a First Amendment issue, right? It's about political speech. Will you come back? I'd love to. That would be great. Her name is Amanda Hollis-Broski. She is a professor at Pomona College. My name is Brad Pomerantz, and this is California Edition.